hire people that are good in the business because I'm not. Owning a restaurant is not a hobby, it's a business. Some people are good at both, and if that's you are, then that's great. But you have to recognize your strengths, and you have to recognize your weaknesses. Every time before opening, I told people, I want to build a family before team. Because if you are a family, we will be together to complete this circle. Are there shortcuts that one can take? Or is practice theory just as important as practice from your ex experience or some people can maybe move towards the practice. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here on Gems of Arabia podcast. Today we are at Spaka, a um, steakhouse which is, has a much more authentic side than the usual steakhouse. We have the honor of having uh, Mrs. Nancy Silverson with us today. Welcome to Saudi Arabia. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. It's lovely to have you here. We also have uh, one of our most promising chefs, Wola Sonbol. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much. Today we would like to discuss uh, the importance of understanding how um, culinary and that kind of expertise can also lead to strong entrepreneurship future. Taking the culinary uh, brilliance to the next step and having role models, mentors such as yourselves who can really kind of change the narrative in KSA eh? and create this movement. Starting with Mrs. Nancy, how did your, your, your journey into uh, becoming such a renowned, can I say, um, baker, chef? Whatever uh, you want. Restaurant, <laughs> how about restaurateur? Restaurateur. Yeah, now I'm sort of all facets and I'm an owner and once you're an owner of not only one restaurant, but I have a, a, a handful of restaurants now. Um, unfortunately, we're forced to step. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, because my passion starts with cooking, right? Okay. Being behind the stove. But as you get bigger and you acquire or, or open more restaurants, yeah. you start to be drawn out of the kitchen more and into the, you know, just sort of your own little empire. Um, so when you say, how should I talk, what should I say? Should I say you're a baker or a chef or I'm sort of a restaurateur, kind of a little bit of all of it. Right. Yes. But I've uh, I know that at least for myself, I've mentored enough good people that they are my eyes, my ears, my palate, my passion. Right. And they um, are the people that I trust to uh, kind of bring my way of uh, relating to food to the plate. It really is um, uh, an empire that is being created through, through ingredients, through, through culinary, through passion. Uh, tell me, uh, Willa, what do you think is an essential quality to have when you are working towards that? Like, uh, would, does each chef have to identify what is their style? What is their palate or how does it work when someone identifies that they have a, a certain, as they say, je ne sais quoi, of, uh, of culinary uh, excellence or expertise? No, I think it's all about passion and what you like, you know. And if you like, if you like to cook, you know, just like um, go with the, what we have in, in your hand and just put your touch on it, okay? And it will work. And that's like, this is me, you know. So what, what kind of advice would you have to give a new starting chef that wants passion. to? You have to have a passion. This is my word always. If you have a passion for food, it will work. Passion, discipline, attention and the caring of small details, you know. Discipline, a lot of things, a lot, a lot. Mrs. Nancy, what kind of elements do you think are required in um, being able to have a certain, is there a certain style that one needs to have? Do they know what their style is? Or is, did you find out what, what you're, you're, you, you have a knack for um, in cooking more than, for example, something that's, that's regular? Do you, do you by any chance feel that you are more of an, have an for example, you, you have taken upon uh, the rye bread and you've taken upon perfecting it in your own way with the artisanal uh, making of uh, the local bread. What kind of step does it take for one to realize that they have that skill 
in, in culinary. I don't think it's recognizing the skill because the skill comes if you have drive. Good. So I think you have to, first of all, fall in love with the concept of cooking, the concept of uh, nurturing, the concept of uh, pleasing, but I think you have to please yourself. So I think you have to have a vision and I think you have to be focused. Um, I think that when I go to a restaurant and I realize that whoever is cooking does not have that vision and does not have that focus and I read the menu and it looks very confused, I think the food tastes confused. So I think you have to have that vision and that focus, uh, but I think you also have to have the confidence. And I think that you can taste the food of a confident cook and you can taste the food of a lesser confident cook. Yeah. So don't you think yeah. so? And you can't be afraid. You can't be afraid to, uh, to create and to, um, to fulfill that journey, right? If you're afraid and you want to just please people yeah. or you don't know what you want and you want to do because your neighbor is doing it or because it's trendy or for everything that are the wrong reasons, what you got to do is you got to start from your heart and you got to put the heart on the plate. And how could you not please people? Exactly. But if you, if there's a disconnect between here and the plate, then you taste it in the food. I like that. Um, heart and the plates. Yeah. Who are the people that have kind of, you know, we know that obviously uh, Mr. Wolfgang has been a, a major inspiration for you. And we had some very interesting conversations about the experience that, that is provided uh, and the importance of providing that experience. Can we maybe get into that again? Um, you mentioned uh, what also inspired you is the g giving an experience of service when we walk into a place. Um, how important is service to you? Uh, extremely important. You know, we were having a informal conversation before we turned on the microphone and we were sort of, I was saying for myself that Working for uh, Wolfgang back in 1982, I was his opening pastry chef for his first restaurant before he was a world famous celebrity chef as he is now. Um, but I was so impressed by how so early on and so early on kind of in the, um, just sort of the, I'm not saying that he created restaurants and he created dining, because obviously that's not true. But I think he came about at a time where the importance of restaurants were just starting and becoming explosive. There was always in every country around the world a handful of very special restaurants that people used to love. But the restaurant scene as we know it today had not yet started. So he was the beginning of that world explosion in restaurants. And I was just so impressed by how he recognized at such an early beginning of that explosion, the importance of the hospitality, meaning the front of the house, how the diners are taken care of, and the importance of the food. And that there was no separation between the two and neither one was more important. And for me, it was such a uh, important lesson and one that I took on when I started to open my own restaurants. I think uh, uh, service uh, completes the entire experience. So you have a, a wonderful meal and you combine it with service, uh, you can guarantee that you're gonna go back uh, no matter how many times. Whereas if the meal is great, but service isn't so great, you would think twice about it. I'm talking from my own personal experience. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Tell me, what about you? How important is service to you and what does it represent? Like, this is my third restaurant I opened like in Saudi. So uh, every time before opening, I told people, I want to build a family before team. Because if you are a family, we will like, we will be together, you know? Yeah. Like, like the main is in the kitchen, you know, kitchen is the main. Yeah. <laughs> and the service, it's become like, I don't know how I can explain this, it's belong to each other, you know? We can say the kitchen, the food, and we can say the service. It's all together to complete this circle, you know? The, the, the main topic, the question that we, that we had is, is, what are the main ingredients towards building your culinary empire? 
Um, any other ingredients that we can, we have service, we have passion, we have love. Any other points that we need to, to be a uh, well, team, right? Yes. A team, a family, right? And, you know, interestingly enough for myself, it's something that I didn't expect. I was sort of, in a, that I was gifted the staff. It wasn't a staff that I curated like I would in my own home. I didn't exactly. know any, you know, so I arrived and I had cooks and I had servers and I had managers. And I got to tell you, I lucked out because from the service staff to our managers, I work the closest with the cooks, and I can tell you they are so on board and have already become key Spaka. I mean, they've already become the face of key Spaka. They are doing such an incredible job. And you mentioned uh, that this is your second time in, in, in right. Saudi Arabia. Yeah. It was first only because I was asked to come visit the site so I could you know, but believe me, the site, I don't even think there was a wall up. I mean, there may have been a wall up here, but not more than that. So it was, it went up pretty quickly after, after they finally committed. Over two or I think three like, years? Uh, or yeah, one something. and a half years, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um, and welcome to Saudi Arabia. Thank yeah. you. Are, are there any um, specific uh, dishes uh, that are Arabic or that are from the culture? that maybe uh, we can introduce to Mrs. Nancy to create a collaborative uh, kind of uh, fusion uh, type of cuisine? Has this been already kind of yeah. a discussion or? Yeah, but we have like something in Saudi Arabia, we call it, uh, it's similar to pancake, you know, it's called marasia. Uh -huh. And this year it's honey on top of that. I wish like, uh, yeah, we can do something like that. We yeah, need I, I need the chance to eat out. I haven't, yeah, I've, yeah, just yeah, been, sure. I've just been here. I'm trying to incorporate, <clears throat> sorry, some of the ingredients that I see at the markets. <clears throat> I'm, you know, using some dates and I'm using honey. One of our desserts but this, has... Yeah, this is one honey. based on honey and flour. It's very easy, simple recipes, but it tastes amazing, you know, and a little bit of flavor on it, like Arabic Saudi flavor in it. Yeah. So I noticed that you have, uh, going back to the artisanal breads that, that you have kind of created, um, Maybe it would be interesting to see how artisanal uh, produce can be identified from the local culture. You know, um, what would be the step in kind of bringing that to life or creating that? Like, what would you advise? Uh, well, uh, the one issue you get into when you're saying, what things can you use that are not local, right? So yeah. I know there's melons, they're definitely local. I think the eggplant is, yeah. I'm not positive, um, and some other ingredients like that. But when you get into more of the kind of specialty, more exotic, you run the risk of them not living up to the flavor profile they would live up to if, they, if you ate them where they were grown. Okay. You know, so oftentimes those kinds of things are picked under ripe. Lots of times they're coming at a season. So you're not positive what you're getting. So you need to taste first. That's the that's important part. That's the most important things. Yeah, the is to taste. But there's nothing like what's local. Like for instance, the local rucola. It's a different variety that I'm used to. It's grown locally. It's from the same family, different look, but fantastic flavor. So I'm trying to use more of that local rucola than the rucola that would be brought in, brought in from, from France or Italy or somewhere else, you know, because it has to taste better. Yeah. And what about the spices that you use here? I'm sure there's a plethora of different spices. That, uh, are there specific spices that, that resonated with you that are not, um, not from the norm, from what, what you're used to? Well, so far not, because remember, what we're trying to bring to Saudi is we're trying to bring Kisbaka to Saudi. We're not trying to create a fusion restaurant. So there's certain spices that we use anyway. Uh, we use, say, coriander and we use cumin, you know. So, you know. Um, and those are the ones that are going with our dishes. You know, we can't compete with Kisbaka and, and what we're bringing because it's a very focused restaurant. However, I am open to 
using more of what's here. There's a lot. I'm, I'm finding, I don't know if they're local or not. I'm finding a lot of hazelnuts, yeah. a lot of pistachio, and which we use also. So to use more of, you know, items that we use anyway. Yeah. And uh, please tell us more about uh, Spaka, the, the dynamics of how you, you serve the meat and well, you know, uh, Spaka was created. Uh, we kind of call it a butcher-friendly restaurant. We try to look at it the way a butcher would look at serving food at, if the butcher had a restaurant. So we try to utilize as much of the whole animal out of respect and not being wasteful. So we don't just use, even though the meats that you see over here that we're aging are the prime cuts, you know, those are the easy cuts for people to order because they're luxurious and they love them but we're trying to use the trotter and we're trying to use the neck and we're trying to use the shank. Uh, we're trying to use all of them. With our fish, we're trying to use whole fish. It's from the Red Sea, but it's beautiful. And we're serving them in larger formats. So we're not cutting them up into small tasting portions. These are portions that are meant to be shared. What's different than maybe what you would think of Kiesbaka or a butcher friendly restaurant is we have a good selection of salads and a good selection of vegetables. Vegetables are really important for me in my diet and the way I want to eat. And we're trying to introduce as many as those to the menu as possible. Okay, interesting. Um, I think that, you know, keeping that balanced, healthy approach is, is key. Um, especially in Saudi, I think people are becoming much more uh, mindful of healthy eating. Uh, uh, what, what do you think is the, the Saudi, what do you, would you say is the Saudi palate? Um, I mean, a typical Saudi palate from the dishes that you have, for example. Like I can, I, th I think like we can add the Saudi touch in each dish. Yeah. Yeah, this is me. I can put my own identity and my own, from what I came in each dish, you know, even in my cakes, even in my salads. Yeah. Like I can put our spices, our touch, as I said before, to bring it to the level that I want. But are we more prone to be on the, uh, for example, the spicy side, or do we prefer more, yeah, more sometimes, carbs? Or? Yeah, sometimes I put like in a spicy side, sometimes I yeah. use local product in a matter of like potato, or in each kind of potato, like kind of meat, you know? And the same, like I took the meat from here, the local, I put some uh, spices, like let's say Mexican spices on it. Uh -huh. and I have a wonderful dish at the end of the day, you know? And that's what I'm doing, honestly. Like, I love to put a little bit of touches, not too much, to change the entire dish, you know? Please tell us, uh, Ms. Nancy, you mentioned that you are from, uh, from a certain area in Italy, and this is kind of what, what describes your palate and uh, your appreciation towards uh, Italian uh, cuisine. So maybe you can give us a little bit more information on that. Well, I'm not from Italy. I'm You're from the United States. Okay. And I grew up in Los Angeles, and that's where I live. But I... For the last 22 years, I've owned a small little home in Umbria, which is the sort of the middle, the yeah. green belt, the middle of Italy, and it just borders on uh, Tuscany. So the food that I understand the most and um, kind of utilize the most in my cooking is the flavor from Tuscany, Umbria. So, uh, and, and I have to say, I've incorporated a lot from the South just because I love capers and olives and anchovies, and that's coming more from, you know, Southern Italy and, and, and Sicily. Um, and so, you know, the food that we prepare uh, gets a lot of its flavor from the grill, from the wood oven, and in just the regular oven, slow roasting for a very, very long time to bring out the natural flavors. So everything you get on the plate and you order, you'll recognize where it came from. It won't be an eggplant that we carved and put in a circulator and all of a sudden it comes out in tiny pearls and you're like, what was that? You know, yeah. what you see is exactly the way you saw the vegetable, but oftentimes it's served whole, but just again, cooked for a long time because what cooking does is it concentrates the flavor and brings out and makes it a lot more aggressive, the flavor. So you're gonna, we're not shy of flavors. When you eat here, you're gonna get a flavorful meal, I promise you. So in the midst of, of, of uh, creating uh, this amazing cuisine and, and, and building uh, an empire, 
uh, there's also the, the, the business aspect and the, the having a sense of business acumen. So how, how does one maintain this sense of business with the cooking and with yeah. the inspiration and with the service? And so how, how does one maintain that? You want me to answer it honestly? You hire people that are good in the business because <laughs> I'm not. You know, I mean, owning a restaurant is not a hobby. It's a business. And sometimes... Lifestyle too. Yeah, well, and lifestyle too. Yeah. But some people are good at both. And if that's you are, then that's great. But you have to recognize your strengths yeah. and you have to recognize your weaknesses. My strength is in the kitchen. My weaknesses is business. And so I just make sure that I hire people that can keep me in business. Because if it was up to me, I don't think I'd be in business. Yeah, but I think to, like, to <laughs> manage some people, it's not true. I, I can manage the floor I could, but not, not the, the whole thing. Not the economics. Yeah, because it's if you want to manage the risk, the whole restaurant, that means you will be missed in one part, you know? Mm -hmm. For like for as a chef, like you have to manage the kitchen. Yeah. Daily and every day to maintain the quality, to make sure the product is amazing. Because I'm keeping teaching people about the product. And he said, one of, like, one of the chefs, he said, I did the ingredients at the recipe as you told us. I said, no, sometimes you have to try the product before you make the recipe. Yeah. Because sometimes it will be old and is not rich of the flavor. You know, this is matter. So I think to maintain the whole things, yeah, you need to hire people. Yeah. I mentioned also that, uh, I remember you mentioning how uh, taking a certain route of education is is essential, although uh, yeah, I, you mentioned uh, in some of your, your uh, I read a couple of your articles, uh, and you would say that uh, you weren't planning on going to school, but then your, your, your dad insisted and said, no, you know, why don't you go to the best? He said, which, which school? He said, the Gordon Bleu. So you, you're a graduate of the Gordon Bleu, and that was a decision that was uh, jointly uh, taken uh, by your parents and yourself. It's interesting to see uh, that uh, dynamic and what do you have to say for the younger generation? Like, are there shortcuts that one can take? Or is practice theory just as important as practice from your ex ex experience? So, or some people can maybe move towards the practice? Yeah, you know, when I, this, we're, we're talking back, I went to the Cordon Bleu in 1977. Yeah. Okay, so that's quite a long time ago before you were born, I'm sure, right? So 1977 is when I went to the Cordon Bleu. And before I went, it was a year waiting list to go on, to get in, so I signed up in 1976. I didn't even know there was such a thing as cooking schools. All I knew is during my earlier years that I went to college is when I developed this passion for cooking and I wanted to be a cook. So I didn't finish my, what you would say, your traditional college years. In my senior year, my last year, I decided I had enough of that sort of training and I wanted just to cook. And that's when my father said, okay, I understand you need to follow your dream, but can you please consider going to cooking school? Like again, those days, I didn't even know there was such a thing. And I was like, sure, I'll go to cooking school. I'm really glad I did. Um, and it wasn't a long program. It was only like six months in, in London for the Cordon Bleu. In the United States, we have the Culinary Institute. That's like a two or three year program, much more, or four year, I don't even know, two to four years, much more of a commitment. Um, but, um, but I went and I'm glad that I got that education. But you could also get the education just working in a restaurant if you can get exactly. someone to hire you. Experience. And you, yeah, experience. Experience. But I think the, what's different about when I started cooking and what's different about now is either somebody comes out of culinary school now and they already want to be a head chef somewhere. Yeah. Or they get hired at a restaurant and they start usually at what is looked at as the simplest part of the restaurant, which is the cold side, which I don't agree with because I think it's really difficult. That salad, let's call it the salad station. I think it's a very difficult station, at least in my restaurants. But that's where you start. After three months, they might think, okay, I've learned it all, now I'm ready to be the head chef. So people don't understand that it takes years to get to the level of all of the people that they may look up to in the, in the food world. Wolfgang Puck started apprenticing at a restaurant in, either, in Austria when he was 13 years old. He's 70 something. 
He's still cooking, but it took him a long time from 13. And today's generation wants to get there. You know, everything is instant now because yeah. of the way the world is, you know. And so the practice is actually much more important than the theory itself. Yeah, the practice is really important. And also the patience and the respect that it that the people that you see as the lead, say, cook in the restaurant you're working at, the chef, oftentimes the owner, they didn't get there in two months. Yeah. More. They put, you've got to put in yeah. the hours. Exactly. More. Right? Half of your day you spend inside the kitchen, you know? Yeah. If you didn't have the passion, as I said, right. nobody can continue. Do you agree with this, huh? Yes, hundred percent, hundred percent. It becomes from experience, from standing in the kitchen more than fifteen hours per day. I can only imagine, you know, uh, the the art of cooking is, is such a it's, it's it's a craft and it's an art in itself, you know. So uh, the the way we see it, but now even more so, you know. Um, and what about the mission stars? You know, those come. But that's not, at least for myself, that's not what drives me. Okay. So I'm lucky at one of my restaurants to have a Michelin star. You know, it puts you in a league with, and I think as far as diners, sometimes they only look like, I want to go to a Michelin restaurant, you know. That's not what drives me. So that, that's like the, what do you call it, the icing on the cake, you know. It's like, <laughs> right? But it's the cake that's important. I remember you, you mentioned that, uh, you were happy to have a mission star, but, but maintaining it was also another added, yeah, added right. uh, kind of... Because yeah. then when you lose it, it's like, oh no, what do we do? So it's yeah. true. It's the good and the bad, right? Uh, no, uh, congratulations on, on all your uh, milestones and accolades and, and to you too for Thank doing this so great much. work. Uh, I usually have my signature questions, which are, uh, what is authenticity to you, Mrs. Nancy? It's truth, you know? Again, authentic, if you're authentic, and you're, it is the same as being truthful, honest. Honest, right. Completely agree, yeah, absolutely. Same, honest. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I yeah. think because we are chefs, we are yeah. a cook. Yeah. yeah. No, I think, I think uh, nothing could be more truthful than w w I mean, what you mentioned, uh, yeah, heart on a plate, you know, and if you can yeah. feel that and uh, you can sense it in the cuisine. Oh, and yeah. It's, it's really incredible how food can represent so many things. You know if you're eating food of somebody that cares. That makes a lot of sense, yeah. Um, I don't know if you've seen a movie called Con Agua para Chocolate. Water for Chocolate, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now I think that movie could, be, uh, could not be more indicative of yeah. uh, the, the love that one puts into yeah. the food and how food can tell an entire story and uh, really, really incredible movie. Sadly, I didn't pick up the knack for, uh, for cooking after that movie, <laughs> but I can only imagine that anyone that, that, that knows how to cook uh, would appreciate that movie. So yep. anyone that's watching, who, that's watching uh, definitely watch Like Water for Chocolate. Uh, but today, uh, we wanted to thank uh, Mrs. Nancy and Willa for uh, being with us today. It's an honor to have you with us, Saudi. And uh, may you continue to thrive and, and shine and uh, be an uh, example to a lot of great young entrepreneurs that want to pursue uh, culinary. Uh, there is a, a plethora of really uh, interesting and young and dynamic uh, Saudi males, females that want to pursue this. And uh, we need to have a benchmark. We need to have that kind of vision to see that it is possible. So uh, when you, we have amazing concepts coming into Saudi like this, uh, sky's the limit. Yeah, yeah, of yeah. course. So, thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure time. sitting at the table with you. The thank pleasure you. is mine. You hire people that are good in the business because I'm not. Owning a restaurant is not a hobby. It's a business. Some people are good at both. And if that's you are, then that's great. But you have to recognize your strengths and you have to recognize your weaknesses. Every time before opening, I told people, I want to build a family before team. Because if you are a family, we will be together to complete this circle. Are there shortcuts that one can take or is practice theory just as important as practice from your experience or some people can maybe move towards the practice.